do all people have value in the eyes of God? Yes. All people are sinners in the eyes of God. Yes. Jesus Christ came for one purpose and one purpose only. You only have to read the gospels once to get this. And that is he came to give his life in order to save us from our sins. That's the whole point. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Salty Pastor Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping you learn and grow in your faith. Mm -hmm. Your faith journey is not something you can Uber out and ask for <laughs> delivery. It is something that you actually have to do. You have to show up to the faith gym and put the work in. Put the work. You mean I can't order a strong faith on Amazon? No, you cannot. And you can't even get two-day delivery on anything these days, so it's fine. Uh, we are here to be your coaches and challenge you, uh, encourage you. Uh, entertain you a little bit, but ultimately try to teach you how to critically think for yourself so that you are not caught flat footed when you are mm -hmm. asked what you believe and why you believe it. My name yeah. is Jesse Mayer. I'll be your host and we cannot do the Salty Pastor podcast without the Salty Pastor himself, <laughs> Dr. Douglas Peak. So good to be with you, everybody. I'm glad you're listening today. We're digging into this stuff about politics and we started off talking about what you know, it, are the options. That was the first one we yep, did last week. week. Options. Yeah. This week we're kind of talking about, well, what is the church specifically next week? It's what do you specifically, and then what's the end goal for the kingdom mm. on the last week. So we really want to dig into the church this week to align our expectations with God's expectations of the church. And that's going to help us when we really clarify that and know it, it gives you a tremendous amount of guidance, a tremendous amount of focus on my expectations of what my church should be doing to help in this circumstance. Absolutely. So on Tuesday, we discussed the primary source text in the New Testament mm -hmm. concerning the mission of the church. That's yes. kind of our focus this week. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is how politically involved should we as a church be in American politics right now. Yeah, that's uh, Thursday is dedicated to being highly practical in the mm -hmm. immediate. And we need to practically apply these principles that we studied from Tuesday. And remember, we said the mission of the church is to lead people to Jesus Christ, to disciple them into maturity, right? Correct. And the leadership of the church, one of the jobs is uh, to protect everybody from false teaching, right? We're yes. going to dig into that. So number one, our mission, uh, practically speaking, applied to the circumstance of politics in America today is that our mission should be to create the best circumstance in which people can discover Jesus Christ and meet him. Okay. okay. And that's different because it's like this. It's like when you have kids, right? If you do everything for your kids when they're growing up, what do they grow up into? people who are reliant on you to do yeah. everything for them for them. They're kind of sport. If you give your kids everything they want, they grow up to be what entitled yeah, entitled. And so if you ignore your kids, they grow up directionless. If, so it, it's creating the right environment. We should see society in all of its uh, imperfections, right? Uh, as a opportunity for people to meet Jesus. Right. This of course is one of the most, uh, strongest refutations of the atheistic position that there is no God because there is suffering in the world. Mm. Because in order to refute their logic, all you have to do is say that, well, what if there is a morally sufficient reason for God to allow suffering to exist? Okay. Okay. Well, and one of the biggest things is when do people tend to think about God? When they're in suffering. When they're in trials. suffering. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because we live in a sinful world that we created. And so it's oftentimes until we suffer the consequences of the sinfulness of this world that we begin to think of who God really is and how we are delivered. Number two, we cannot force people to have faith in Christ. I cannot force my kids to grow up and mature. I cannot force people to meet Jesus like Charlemagne did, you know? Right. And, uh, this is called the doctrine of non coercion, right. right? We cannot coerce people. Uh, number three, we must proclaim Jesus personally. Our witness as a church is dependent on how often we are proclaiming Jesus in a personal way. This is Matthew chapter 25. And I believe that this is why churches in particular need to focus on feeding the poor and clothing the naked and, uh, 
uh, supporting the widow. And one thing that I'm extremely proud of at Foothills Christian Church is that though we are a discipleship oriented church and we focus on that very specifically, unlike many churches in the Southwest corner of, of uh, the treasure Valley, or excuse me of Idaho, which is the treasure Valley is that we have a food pantry that feeds sometimes thousands of people over the course of a month. We have, we, we do incredible outreach to the foster care community. We do a tremendous amount of things where we help, uh, 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 men's shelters for homeless men and those who are out of prison and transitional housing. Uh, w- the list just goes on and on and on of the things we do as a church. You know, one, one of my favorite little things that our outreach ministry does is on, uh, uh, over the next couple of weeks is they go out, they get uh, Starbucks coffee and donuts. It happened this morning. Yeah, this morning. Yeah. So we went out and we gave coffee and donuts to a bunch of schools in the area to the teachers. So yes. To show their, our appreciation to their devotion to education of the next generation. Yeah. And so we're doing all that kind of stuff. So that, so then that's really important. I think so that when I turn around and say that, well, our public educational system is in trouble and it needs help. I'm just not some voice out there crying in the wilderness. You see what, this is the church that does all this stuff. And so, wow, maybe see, we've won a hearing is what Mm. we've done. So we need to proclaim Jesus. And that's part of our ministry. We must stand opposed. And this is what's really important to the ideological values that are in opposition to Jesus Christ and his reality. Mm. And this is why I am a a uh, voracious critic of communism and Marxist ideology, because what it does is it has the exact antithesis of reality that allows people to meet Jesus. Mm. And so it locks people in a statist revolutionary thought that's atheistic in nature and it destroys their humanity and history has proven this over and over and over again. It is unmistakable in its outcome. So that's what we need to do right now. Create a circumstance where Jesus can uh, uh, be introduced and met on his terms, not ours. We can't force people to believe in Christ, so we can't force Jesus on them. So we have to figure out we need to win a hearing by proclaiming him through service. But we also need to stand opposed to the ideologies that are antithesis to who he is. Mm. So you initially started this series by analyzing four basically common responses that the church in America uses pretty often. So option one was the Benedictine uh, model, which is to withdraw, Mm -hmm. go hide out in our holes. Yes. The Charlemagne option which is to seize power and make everybody do what we want. Yes. Uh, Option three is the embrace everything option, which means we adopt the societal trends of the time. And the fourth option, which is don't take sides option. We just love everybody and everything's fine and we're okay. Yeah. Um, But then on Tuesday, you set me up and saying that there was only four, (laughs) but really there was a fifth, or maybe you didn't say there was only four. You just had only talked about four. I'd only talked about, oh, you're giving me the benefit of the doubt. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, (laughs) I was coming a little salty, but I will say that there, this fifth one made it sound like maybe there was a better option. Well, I think, you know, let's rehash or not rehash, but re re Review is that a better word? Revisit. Revisit the flaws in the option. The Benedictine option assumes the unspoken premise is that we are only a pro, uh, to produce spiritual fruit, uh, not material or existential f- fruit in this material realm. Okay. Um. Uh, so the, no- the notion is that uh, if we focus on being purely spiritual, uh, we shouldn't have any real world impact, which we know is just not true because like, for instance, love, right? Love is not purely spiritual. Love produces a real impact in everyday life, right? right? And the way you treat people. The Charlemagne option assumes that politics is the goal of the church and people meeting Jesus is secondary. And that's why I don't like that. And that is, is that, well, you don't, as long as you profess Christianity, you know, according to Charlemagne, we don't care. Right. But see, that's not Jesus. It's a personal it can see when Jesus says, I want to know you personally, what is he doing? This is an ideological truth, a propositional truth, an axiomatic truth. It's metaphysical in nature, meaning it com- encompasses everything. It's always true all the time. And that is Jesus wants to know you. And by that simple statement, what he's saying is that God values you as an individual. Mm. And so that's where our notion of individual sovereignty comes from. 
It, it doesn't come from any other philosophy, ideological bent, any other religion. It doesn't exist. It only comes from the Christian statement that God came to save you. And that's critically important. Um, the embrace everything option is completely flawed because it rejects the call to live righteous and holy lives and show the world who we need to be. Uh, the don't take sides in order to become the conscience of the world is flawed because it assumes that people discover they, their faith, they discover Jesus apart from real world interaction. However, people's political beliefs are a result of their culture and culture is a result of their morality and morality is a result of their values and that's the spiritual foundation. So politics is downstream of culture, culture is downstream of morality, morality is downstream of our spiritual values. Okay. And see, so you can't just say don't take sides because what you're doing is you're not acknowledging the shift, uh, uh, the downstream shift of politics and culture from spirituality. Mm -hmm. So that's really important is, is it, it's a link that flows one to another okay. and you can't separate that link. The fifth option is what, and that's why I call it the upstream option is that it shows you the, how this link works. And that is spiritual values must be articulated, defended, and taught and in, instilled within people that influences their moral decisions. All right. And their moral decisions influence their culture. And then their culture is what influences politics. So okay. the way I, I'll restate it this way. Okay. Politics cannot be, cannot supplant the supremacy of Jesus. However, if Jesus is supreme, then we are committed to his values, right? So these right. are our spiritual values. And what happens is these spiritual values produce a morality okay. amongst people. And then that morality develops a culture. And then that culture is what politics develops around. Right. right. These political movements. So you, when you look at it this way, you must conclude that we have no choice but to be involved politically. It's how we are to do it, which is critical. Right. Absolutely. And, and that's really the point. So of upstream thinking about the church. So the best way to be influential politically as a church is to focus on the values of Jesus and develop those values clearly in a life for everyone who follows him. Yes. So why is the spiritual value clarification so important when it comes to political influence of the church? Well, because if remember we talked on Tuesday that sometimes what people do who are Christians is they, they interpret the mission of the church through their spiritual gift. Right. And so then they say, well, if the church would be more like my spiritual gift, it'd be more successful. And it's important to actually understand what Jesus said the church is to do. And one of the most important admonitions for the people he appoints as the leaders of the church is that we are to protect the church, the flock from false teaching, false ideology or false values. And so that's really important. Now I want to show a video of, of, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is a Congresswoman from New York and she, I, I'm not showing this to be uh, political. I want people who are independent politically, people who are Democrats, uh, liberals to listen to the salty pastor. What I, I'm doing this though, is because this example is a hundred percent perfect in how it res represents uh, a conflation. Okay? okay. And non sequiturs. A non sequitur is when you make a statement that does not logically follow the statement you made before. And so now somebody made this as a political ad her, she made a speech in Congress and somebody made a political ad for her, right? Using this speech, using this speech. And so some of the video you're going to see, it takes shots at various other people. Uh, at the time, I think Trump was a president when she made this. So they, she takes shots at him and churches and some other things, okay. but I want you to listen to it. It's two minutes long and then we'll go through it real quick. So let's play it. Sometimes, especially in this body, I feel as though if Christ himself walked through these doors and said what he said thousands of years ago, that we should love our neighbor and our enemy, that we should welcome the stranger, fight for the least of us, that it is easier 
for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into a kingdom of heaven, he would be maligned as a radical and rejected from these doors. It is part of my faith that all people are holy and all people are sacred unconditionally. And that is what prompts us to transform because it is unconditional. It's not about that it is up to us to love parts of people. We love all people. There is nothing holy about rejecting medical care of people. There is nothing holy about turning someone away from a hospital. There's nothing holy about rejecting a child from a family. There's nothing holy about writing discrimination into the law. And I am tired of communities of faith being weaponized and being mischaracterized because the only time religious freedom is invoked is in the name of bigotry and discrimination. It is not up to us to deny medical care. It is up to us to feed the hungry, to clothe the poor, to protect children, and to love all people as ourselves. We are equal in the eyes of the law, and we are equal in my faith in the eyes of the world. So there you go. That was interesting. And what we call this is conflation. Okay. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up is she has so many non sequiturs in there because she said, we don't want to deny people health care. And I don't know of anybody who is advocating a denial of health care for people, what she's referencing is abortion. You see, she's saying that abortion is health care and that it should be paid for by the federal government. And then she makes another statement that religious freedom is only invoked for bigotry. And what that is, is that's a statement that she has made in other areas that she's basically saying is that uh, any religious community has no right to deny abortion coverage to its employees and religious communities should be forced to hire uh, people from the LGBTQ plus community that is in opposition to these religious communities. And so what she's saying is that you don't have religious freedom because you're a bigot. And what I find fascinating, I'm not saying all Democrats think like her. She doesn't represent the majority of Democrats, in my opinion, right? But what she's doing is she is conflating all of this. And then the biggest conflation is this. She takes statements of Jesus out of context, rolls them all together, and then says that everyone is holy. This is a refutation 100% of the most prominent statements of Jesus Christ. Okay. Mm. And John three sixteen comes to mind. The one that everybody <laughs> knows, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the point is Jesus said this over and over again. No one is holy. That's the point. No one is holy. You didn't have to come here if we were all holy, right? You are all sinners, right? And he says, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself right? Pick up your cross and follow me. He said, I came to give my life as a ransom for many. So what, what she did is she took Jesus, uh, statements of Jesus. She balled them all together, right? And then made radically unchristian statements that refute the gospel. Do all people have value in the eyes of God? Yes. All people are sinners in the eyes of God. Yes, Jesus Christ came for one purpose and one purpose only. You only have to read the gospels once to get this. And that is he came to give his life in order to save us from our sins. That's the whole point. We are not holy in the eyes of God. And when you say unconditional, people are like, well, God loves us unconditionally. It says, well, there is a vow. God is love. So he loves, but he sent his son so that you might know him. And the reason you go to hell isn't because God doesn't like you, but because you chose sin instead of God, 
right? You chose to live in a way that was an opposition to God. And in the result of that, the unpardonable sin is that you blasphemed Jesus. You're saying you didn't need to die for me. You didn't need to come and save me. I don't need that. All I need is for you to affirm whatever I want to be in my life. And so what AOC is doing, I know this is salty, but I wanted to point it out is she is blaspheming against Jesus Christ. And she does it in such a nice, sweet, innocent way. People listen to this. And because people don't have a clear understanding of the gospel, a clear understanding of who Jesus is, a lot of people listen to that and go, well, I agree with that. Why can't the church get on board with being more progressive? Well, and I think the idea of this spin that she's put, you know, the the idea of spin of, I'm going to take these things and then not give you all the context so then you make inferences about what i'm talking about right so it's like me listening not having any context of what speech she was giving in on what it was it's like yeah obviously we don't want anyone to be denied a doctor's visit right like that's that's something everyone can get behind but when you then go well this was part of a larger statement about abortion and these various things then it's like okay well that's not the same Correct. That's not the same thing, right? And so yes. you're you're burying the lead basically of what this is really about. And taking Jesus's words is a pastime of every politician yes. where they can say, As we well, said, Jesus he's a said football. you have to love everyone. And yes. it's like, well, we do love everyone, but that doesn't mean we have to affirm everything that they do. You as a parent don't say, oh, little Johnny stabbed little Susie, but that's okay. I still love, I, you know, yeah. I, that's still okay. Yes. I may still love him but I'm going to discipline him or I'm going to have words. Right. And so it's like, those are two different things. And they are, as you said, conflating them and saying, Oh, well, if you love me, then you'll let me do whatever I want. And it's like, "Eh, that's not how that works. Right. And yeah. And exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there because what transforms us, she was really, you know, focused on this. This is what transform us. What transforms us is, uh, is when we are accepted unconditionally Mm. and the, New Testament doesn't teach that at all. It teaches the exact opposite. It teaches that we are dead in your transgressions and sins. And you, you can only be trans, you could be transformed when you are freed from the cage, the prison of your sinful nature. And there's only one way that that can happen. The power and blood of Jesus Christ. That's why he died on the cross. And that's why he rose from the dead. So it's, it's very powerful. It's very important, I think, to understand that people are using the gospel uh, as a political football. And that's why you need to understand the mission of your church is to focus on the, what Jesus actually taught and actually said. And the reason why I think this is important is because the more the church focuses on addressing the ideologies that are antithetical to the gospel, then the, the better people become informed to make a decision of whether they want to follow Christ or not. Mm. But everything is conflated and disguised and non sequiturs are used that it appeals to your emotions. Right. You know, you listen to that and you go, wow, it's got a little bit of Jesus throwing in it and it's got some great music. And then it, it shows, you know, other politicians doing crazy things. And your emotional response to that is, man, I agree. Right. But, but what you don't realize is that, yeah, it's from a true standpoint, it's a basket of wet spaghetti, you Mm -hmm. know, it's just so entangled. Doesn't make any sense what to uh, whatsoever. And the reason why it's important to know your values and the reason why you want your church to spend its time preaching the gospel, clarifying the values of the gospel, building a worldview in people is because of the rule of 35%, all right? 35%. Yeah. Well, you could say it's the rule of a third. So 33 and a third percent, you could say that, you know, I call it the rule of 35 or principle of 35. And people are like, what in the world is that? This is an axiomatic truth that has gone throughout the world. First of all, when you look, let's just look historically back at the American Revolution. According to historian Robert Calhoun, I don't know if you know this, that 40% of the colonists were neutral. During the Revolutionary yeah, War. Yeah, right. Going, leading up to the Revolutionary War and during the Revolutionary, 40%, almost half of the new people who are going to be newly American 
We're like, man, I could take it or leave it. Yeah, they were neutral, okay. right? And when it started off, before the war started, about 25, almost 30% of the colonists were loyalists, mm. meaning they wanted to stay under the British monarchy. This is where, you know, and it was easy to go back and forth. You know, that's the whole story of Benedict Arnold. You know, you can, he betrayed and went back to the loyalist side. Right. Um, and he, a lot of people didn't, don't know this, but he was the chancellor of West Point. I did not know that. Yeah. So he wasn't just some little guy out there. I mean, he around, had, right. yeah. So he was a loyalist. Uh, he went to the loyalist side. And when it started out, only about 30% of the population were patriots. Uh, during the war, that grew to about 40% to 45% by the end of the war. Okay. So, so 50% of the population at the end of the war was like, not even into this thing. Right. They're like, can we just be done with this? Yeah. But guess what? that 30% birthed a new nation. Mm. Okay. So that's, so in order to transition to something new, you don't need a big majority. You only need the rule of the third. You look at how Hitler came to power. A lot of people are not aware of this, but in 1932, he only got 27% of the vote. Mm. He got less than 30%. Then because they couldn't form a government in 33, they had another vote. And at this point he got 43%. And it was then that he passed the enabling act and basically took all the power and became the chancellor mm. of Germany. Uh, the Bolshevik Re revolution in Russia. A lot of people are not aware is that the Bolsheviks and the socialists and the communists were less than 30% of the population. And yet they were able to invoke a revolution that took over the country. Right. Right. You look at Mao's China, the, uh, the communists are very much in a minority uh, from the majority when they took power and then ultimately started the cultural revolution today. Do you know how, you know, the population of China today is what, you know what it is? It's like 1.3 billion people. That's a lot of people. Do you know how many people in China are members of the communist party? Not just the ruling class, but actually members of the communist party. I do not. 91 million. Oh my gosh. So less than 10%. Okay. And they, they rule everything. You know, it helps when you're a dictatorship and you have the army behind you. Right. Um, but it's not just in political situations. It's also in religious situations. You know, um, here's something that's really interesting. In Islam, a lot of people do not know this, but when you live outside of an Islamic country, you're on the Hadith says you live under a certain set of rules. These rules give you a lot more freedom. Okay. But as soon as the population in the country, you live in the Muslim population hits a certain percent, you are required by the Hadith to impose Sharia law. Do you know what that percent is? Probably about 30%. That's right. Okay. 30%. Wow. You are an educated I'm, guesser. I'm, I'm learning how you set me up for these sometimes, <laughs> but after you see 200 something episodes. So they're, they're buying into this. Okay. It only takes 30%. Now what's really interesting is that the moral culture, right. And politics of America were, was pretty, uh, steady until the sixties okay. prior to 65, the people who were active Christians, people actively going to church and practicing their faith was around 35%. Okay. Do you know what it is today? Probably less than that. I would 22%. Okay. So everybody knows this, this basic axiom about you only need about a third. What does that mean then? Is that means that everybody, every political party, anybody who wants to do anything is not trying to get a majority. What they're going to do is they're going to, let's say if they hold 20% of the population, they only want to get 15% of the population to go their way. Okay. That's all it takes. They're not going after everybody. They're just trying to get a little bit more in the same way, in order for society to reflect the best values for human beings without a excess, we need to have, uh, an active dynamic Christian community of 35 to 45%, or I'd say 35 to 40% of people who actually know the values of Jesus and what he teaches in the new Testament, just to be able to say, wouldn't it be great when, she, when, when that person was making that speech in Congress, somebody else stood up and said, Hey, excuse me, but you've totally misrepresented what Christians believe. You're welcome to believe what everything you want. And you're welcome to incite Jesus, but what you're doing right now is heresy and you need to be called out for that. You know, uh, 
I'm not saying you have to believe what I believe, but what you're doing is you're making up your own belief system and then trying to put Jesus's name on it and expecting us to swallow this gigantic pile of steaming malarkey. <laughs> We're not going to do it. Okay. And this is really important to understand because values are critical. We've got to protect the values and that's what your church is so vital to. And it, it, it bothers me that many churches don't even know what the biblical worldview and the values of Christ are. And, and that is disturbing. We need to get back to that. Uh, John Stone Street just wrote recently uh, in an article, he goes, in the ancient pagan world, violence, rape, infant exposure, and prostitution were the rules. They were not exceptions. Almost immediately, Christianity began to revolutionize these pagan ethics, particularly in its view of the poor and the outcast. Roman Emperor Julian, so a Roman emperor who is not a Christian, famously wrote that when the impious Galileans, impious means that they were morally defected, mm -hmm. okay? So he didn't like Christians. So he said the impious Galileans support not only their poor, but our poor as well. All men see that our people lack aid from us. In other words, what he was saying is they're showing us up big time. Right. All right. And he goes on to write this to a world with no reason to believe in the equality of all people. Christianity taught that there is no Gentile or Jew circumcised or uncircumcised barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. This belief is grounded in the Christian view that human person, which had no parallel in the ancient world and which created an explosion of literacy, social mobility and human rights that we now take for granted in the modern world world. He goes on to say Christianity's unique contributions in humanizing the modern world is yet another reason to not simply lump all religious beliefs into one blanket category. All religions are simply not the same, not in substance or impact. Economist Robin Greer wrote, um, uh, conducted a cross-national survey of 63 formerly European colonies. And she found that across the board, Protestant Christianity above all was positively and significantly correlated with real GDP growth and that the level of Protestantism is significantly related to real people per capita income levels. Did you catch that? In strong Protestant countries, guess what? They do better economically than mm. any others. He's, so he goes on to write, notably beliefs about heaven, hell, and afterlife are linked with economic growth. In other words, it's not just about having a religion, but about what your religion teaches. And that's why church in, in the mission of your church is so critical as an upstream thing is because it needs to enter the values discussion and what has happened and this very salty thing to say, but I want people to really consider this is that as conservatives, who tend to be more open to faith have never made value based or moral based arguments against things that the Marxists have been proposing. They make practical arguments against it. Right. And that's why they've lost the culture. All right. Well, we are out of time today, unfortunately, but I am very excited to see where you're going on Sunday with all of this. And I think the definition of our mission as a church is really important because it's yes, it so is. easy for us to get sidelined with our particular passions or talents about what the church should be doing. And what we're seeing with this fifth option, the upstream option is ultimately we need to be focused on these upstream values and what Jesus taught, and that will ultimately get us the things that we're worried about here in the downstream. So thank you so much for sharing with us today, Pastor Doug. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Make sure you're having um, strong conversations about this. Don't just listen yes. to this by yourself, but instead have someone else listen, share it with them on social media, or just engage in a conversation saying, what do you feel about these thoughts? Have them listen to that clip by AOC and go, what do you think about what she said? And then give them the context that Pastor Doug yeah, shared with sure. us so that then they have a better understanding of how they can be misled fairly often by politicians. So thank you guys so much for joining us and we'll see you on Sunday here at Foothills Christian Church. Blessings.